Nationale. The nearest iceberg looked firmly grounded. Waves with the whole fetch of the Atlantic behind them exploded upon it just as they would upon solid rock. Further out, there were other large bergs also stranded by the falling tide and looking like sudden white mountains. Here and there, among them, smaller ones were still afloat, with the wind and the current driving them slowly up the channel. That morning, there were more, I fancy, than we had ever before seen at one time. I paused to look at them, blinding white crags in a blue sea. I think, I said, that I shall write an account of all this. You mean a long one about the whole thing, a book, Phyllis asked. Well, I don't suppose it will ever be a printed book with stiff covers and a cloth binding, but still a book, I agreed. I suppose a book is still a book, even if no one but the writer and his wife ever reads it, she said. There's a chance that someone else might. I've a feeling it ought to be done. After all, we know as much about the whole thing as anyone, in a general way. The specialists know more about their particular bits, of course, but between us, we ought to be able to put together quite a picture. Without references or records, she questioned. If anyone ever does read it, then he'll be able to have the pleasure of digging out the documentation, what's left of it. My idea is simply to give an account of how the whole thing has appeared to me, to us. Stick to me. You can't do it from two points of view, she advised. She huddled her coat more closely round her. Her breath clouded in the cold air. We regarded the icebergs. There seemed to be even more than one had thought. Some of those further out were only visible because of the waves breaking on them as they wallowed along. It'd help us pass the winter, Phyllis conceded, and then perhaps when the spring comes... She let the thought tail off, unfinished. At the end of some reflection, she said, Where will you begin? I've not got as far as thinking of that yet, I confessed. I think you ought to start with that night on board the Guinevere when we saw... But, darling, no one has ever proved that they had anything to do with it. An account, you said... If you're going to need proof of everything, you might as well not start at all. What about that first dive, I suggested? The thing does connect up pretty closely from there, she shook her head. People, if anyone does read it, can disregard what you put in it if they don't like it. But it doesn't help anybody if you go leaving out things that might be important just because you're not absolutely sure. I frowned. I've never been really convinced that those fireballs were... Well, after all, the word coincidence exists because the things do. <laughs> then say so. But the Guinevere is the proper place to begin. All right, I conceded. Chapter One, An Interesting Phenomenon. Unfortunately, in several ways we are not living in the 19th century. Now, if I were you, I would divide the whole thing into three phases. It falls naturally that way. Phase one would be, darling, whose book is this to be? Ostensibly yours, my sweet. I see, rather like my life since I met you. Yes, darling, now, phase one. Gosh, look at that. A large berg thawed below and, undercut by the water, began to turn over with a monstrous deliberation. A great, flat ice face smacked down, sending spray high into the air. The berg kept on rolling, slowed, hung for a moment, then started to roll back. We watched it loll lazily this way and that with decreasing swings until it settled down, presenting an entirely new aspect. Phyllis returned to the matter in hand. Phase one, she repeated firmly, and then paused. No, before that, you want a sort of key question, with a page all to itself. Yes, I agreed. I thought of... But she shook her head, thinking... Presently... Got it, she said. It's by Emily Pettifel, whom I don't suppose you've ever heard of. Quite right, I told her. I thought of... It was in the pink nursery book, she said. She pulled a gloved hand out of her pocket and recited. I shook my head too long. And if I may say so, don't you think the pink nursery book is a trifle out of key? But the last two lines, Mike, 
just right. She repeated them. But, Mother, please tell me, what can those things be that crawl up so stealthily out of the sea? I'm sorry, darling, but it's still no, I said. You won't get anything more appetite. What were you thinking of? Well, I had in mind a thing of Tennyson's. Tennyson, she exclaimed painedly. Listen, I said, and took my turn at recitation. Not one of his major poetical works, I admitted, but even Tennyson was young once. My last couplet was more appropriate. In words and at the moment, but not in spirit. Besides, mine may even come true in the end, I told her. We ding-donged a bit about it, but after all it is supposed to be my book. Phyllis can write her own if she likes. So here goes. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth. Faintest sunlights flee about his shadowy sides. Above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height. And far away into the sickly light, from many a wondrous grot and secret cell, unnumbered and enormous polypi winnow with giant fins the slumbering green. There hath he lain for ages, and will lie battening upon huge sea-worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heat the deep, then once by men and angels to be seen. In roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die. Alfred Tennyson Phase One I'm a reliable witness. You're a reliable witness. Practically all God's children are reliable witnesses in their own estimation, which makes it funny how such different ideas of the same affair get about. Almost the only people I know who agree word for word on what they saw on the night of 15 July are Phyllis and I. And as Phyllis happens to be my wife, people said in their kindly way behind our backs that I over-persuaded her. A thought and a euphemism that could only proceed from someone who did not know Phyllis. The time was 11.15pm. The place, latitude 35, some 24 degrees west of Greenwich. The ship, the Guinevere. The occasion, our honeymoon. About these facts, there is no dispute. The cruise had taken us to Madeira, the Canaries, Cape Verde Islands, and had then turned north to show us the Azores on our way home. We, Phyllis and I, were leaning on the rail, taking a breather. From the saloon came the sound of the dance continuing and the crooner yearning for somebody. The sea stretched in front of us like a silken plain in the moonlight. The ship sailed it as smoothly as if she were on a river. We gazed out silently at the infinity of sea and sky. Behind us the crooner went on baying. I'm so glad I don't feel like him. It must be devastating, Phyllis said. Why do you suppose do people keep on mass-producing these decadent moanings? I had no answer ready for that one, but I was saved the trouble of trying to find one when her attention was suddenly caught elsewhere. Mars is looking pretty angry tonight, isn't he? I hope it isn't an omen, she said. I looked where she pointed at a red spot among myriads of white ones, and with some surprise. Mars does look red, of course, though I had never seen him look quite as red as that. But then neither were the stars, as seen at home, quite as bright as they were here, being practically in the tropics might account for it. Certainly a little inflamed, I agreed. We regarded the red point for some moments. Then Phyllis said, That's funny. It seems to be getting bigger. I explained that that was obviously an hallucination formed by staring at it. We went on staring, and it became quite indisputably bigger. Moreover, there's another one. There can't be two Marses, said Phyllis. And sure enough there was. A smaller red point, a little up from and to the right of the first. She added, and another, to the left, see? She was right about that, too, and by this time the first one was glowing as the most noticeable thing in the sky. It must be a flight of jets of some kind, and that's a cloud of luminous exhaust we're seeing, I suggested. 
We watched all three of them slowly getting brighter and also sinking lower in the sky until they were little above the horizon line and reflecting in a pinkish pathway across the water towards us. Five now, said Phyllis. We've both of us been asked many times since to describe them, but perhaps we're not gifted with such a precise eye for detail as some others. What we said at the time, and what we still say, is that on this occasion there was no real shape visible. The centre was solidly red, and a kind of fuzz round it was less so. The best suggestion I can make is that you imagine a brilliantly red light, as seen in a fairly thick fog, so there is a strong halation, and you will have something of the effect. Others, beside ourselves, were leaning over the rail, and in fairness I should perhaps mention that between them they appear to have seen cigar shapes, cylinders, discs, ovoids, and inevitably saucers. We did not. What is more, we did not see eight, nine, or a dozen. We saw five. The halation may or may not have been due to some kind of jet drive, but it did not indicate any great speed. The things grew in size quite slowly as they approached. There was time for people to go back into the saloon and fetch their friends out to sea, so that presently a line of us leant all along the rail, looking at them and guessing. With no idea of scale, we could have no judgment of their size or distance. All we could be sure of was that they were descending in a long glide which looked as if it would take them across our wake. The fellow next to me was talking no all about St. Elmo's fire to a partner who had never heard of St. Elmo and didn't feel she had missed anything when the first one hit the water. A great burst of steam shot up in a pink plume. Then, swiftly, there was a lower, wider spread of steam which had lost the pink tinge and was simply a white cloud in the moonlight. It was beginning to thin out when the sound of it reached us in a searing hiss. The water round the spot bubbled and seethed and frothed. When the steam drew off, there was nothing to be seen there but a patch of turbulence gradually subsiding. Then the second of them came in, in just the same way, on almost the same spot. One after another, all five of them touched down on the water with great whooshes and hissings of steam. Then the vapour cleared showing only a few contiguous patches of troubled water. Aboard the Guinevere, bells clanged, the beat of the engines changed. We started to change course. Crews turned out to man the boats, men stood by to throw life belts. Four times we steamed slowly back and forth across the area, searching. There was no trace whatever to be found. But for our own wake, the sea lay all about us in the moonlight, placid, empty, unperturbed. The next morning I sent my card in to the captain. In those days I had a staff job with the EBC, and I explained to him that they would be pretty sure to take a piece from me on the previous night's affair. He gave the usual response. You mean BBC, he suggested. The EBC was younger then, and it was necessary to explain almost every time. I did so, and added, As far as I've been able to tell... Every passenger has a different version, so I thought I'd like to check mine with your official one. A good idea, he approved. Go ahead and tell me yours. When I had finished, he nodded and then showed me his entry in the log. Substantially, we were agreed, certainly in the view that there had been five, and on the impossibility of attributing a definite shape to them. His estimates of speed, size and position were, of course, technical matters. I noticed that they had registered on the radar screens and were tentatively assumed to have been aircraft of an unknown type. "'What's your private opinion?' I asked him. "'Did you ever see anything at all like them before?' "'No, I never did,' he said. But he seemed to hesitate. "'But what?' I asked. Well, but not for the record, he said. I've heard of two instances almost exactly similar in the last year. One time it was three of the things by night, the other it was half a dozen of them by daylight. Even so, they seem to have looked much the same, just a kind of red fuzz. Both lots were in the Pacific, though, not over this side. Why not for the record, I asked. In both cases, there were only two or three witnesses, and it doesn't do a seaman any good to get a reputation for seeing things, you know. The stories just got around professionally, so to speak. Among ourselves, we aren't quite as sceptical as landsmen. 
Some funny things can still happen at sea now and then. You can't suggest an explanation I can quote. On professional grounds, I'd prefer not. I'll just stick to my official entry. But reporting it is a different matter this time. We have a couple of hundred witnesses and more. Do you think it'd be worth a search? You've got the spot pinpointed. He shook his head. It's deep there, over three thousand fathoms, and that's a long way down. There wasn't any trace of wreckage in those other cases either? No. That would have been evidence to warrant an inquiry, but they had no evidence. We talked a little longer, but I could not get him to put forward any theory. Presently, I went away and wrote up my account. Later, I got through to London and dictated it to an EBC recorder. It went out on the air the same evening as a filler, just an oddity which was not expected to do more than raise a few eyebrows. So it was by chance that I was a witness of that early stage, almost the beginning, for I have not been able to find any references to identical phenomena earlier than those two spoken of by the captain. Even now, years later, though I am certain enough in my own mind that this was the beginning, I can still offer no proof that it was not an unrelated phenomenon. What the end that will eventually follow this beginning may be, I prefer not to think too closely. I would also prefer not to dream about it either, if dreams were within my control. It began so unrecognisably. Had it been more obvious, and yet it is difficult to see what could have been done effectively, even if we had recognised the danger, recognition and prevention don't necessarily go hand in hand. We recognise the potential dangers of atomic fission quickly enough, yet we could do little about them. If we had attacked immediately, well, perhaps. But until the danger was well established, we had no means of knowing that we should attack, and then it was too late. However, it does no good to cry over our shortcomings. My purpose is to give as good a brief account as I can of how the present situation arose, and, to begin with, it arose very scrappily. In due course, the Guinevere docked at Southampton without being treated to any more curious phenomena. We did not expect any more, but the event had been memorable, almost as good, in fact, as having been put in a position to say, upon some remote future occasion, when your grandmother and I were on our honeymoon, we saw a sea serpent, though not quite. Still, it was a wonderful honeymoon. I never expect to have a better and Phyllis said something to much the same effect as we leant on the rail watching the bustle below. Except, she added, that I don't see why we shouldn't have one nearly as good now and then. So we disembarked, sought our brand new home in Chelsea, and I turned up at the EBC offices the following Monday morning to discover that in absentia I had been rechristened Fireball Watson. This was on account of the correspondence. They handed it to me in a large sheaf and said that since I had caused it, I had better do something about it. There must, I think, be a great many people who go around just longing to be baffled and who, moreover, feel a kind of immediate kin to anyone else who admits bafflement along roughly similar lines. I say roughly because it became clear to me as I read the mail that classifications are possible. There are strata of bafflement. A friend of mine, after giving a talk on a spooky experience, was showered with correspondence on levitation, telepathy, materialization, and faith healing. I, however, had struck a different layer. Most of my correspondents assumed that the sight of the fireballs must have roused me to a corollary interest not only in saucers, but showers of frogs, mysterious falls of cinders, all kinds of lights seen in the sky, and also sea monsters. After I'd sifted through them, I found myself left with a half a dozen which might possibly have reference to fireballs similar to those we had seen. One, referring to a recent experience off the Philippines, I identified with the fair certainty as being a confirmation of what the captain of the Guinevere had told me, and the others seemed worth following up too, particularly a rather cagey approach which invited me to meet the writer at La Plume d'Or, where lunch is always worth having. I kept that appointment a week later. My host turned out to be a man two or three years older than myself who ordered four glasses of Tio Pepe and then opened up by admitting that the name under which he had written was not his own and that he was a flight lieutenant RAF. 
It's a bit tricky, you see, he said. At the moment I'm considered to have suffered some kind of hallucination, but if enough evidence turns up to show that it was not an hallucination, then they're almost certain to make it an official secret. Awkward, you see. I agree that it must be. Still, he went on, the thing worries me, and if you're collecting evidence, I'd like you to have it, though maybe not to make direct use of it. I mean, I don't want to find myself on the carpet. I don't suppose there's a regulation to stop a fellow discussing his hallucinations, but you can never be sure. I nodded understandingly. He went on, it was about three months ago. I was flying one of the regular patrols, a couple of hundred miles or so east of Formosa, I didn't know we... I began... There are a number of things that don't get publicity, though they're not particularly secret, he said. Anyway, there I was. The radar picked these things up when they were still out of sight behind me, but coming up fast from the west. He had decided to investigate and climbed to intercept. The radar continued to show the craft on a straight course behind and above him. He tried to communicate, but couldn't raise them. By the time he was getting the ceiling of them, they were in sight as three red spots, quite bright, even by daylight, and coming up fast, though he was doing close to five hundred himself. He tried again to radio them, but without success. They just kept on coming, steadily overtaking him. Well, he said, I was there to patrol. I told Base that they were a completely unknown type of craft, if they were craft at all, and as they wouldn't talk, I proposed to have a pip at them. It was either that or just let them go, in which case I might as well not have been patrolling at all. Base agreed, kind of cautiously. I tried them once more, but they didn't take a damn bit of notice of either me or my signals, and as they got closer I was doubtful whether they were craft at all. They were just as you said on the radio, a pink fuzz with a deeper red centre. Might have been miniature red suns for all I could tell. And Anyway, the more I saw of them, the less I liked them, so I set the guns to radar control and let them get on ahead. I reckon they must be doing 700 or more as they pass me. A second or two later, the radar picked up the foremost one and the guns fired. There wasn't any lag. The thing seemed to blow up almost as the guns went off, and boy, did it blow. It suddenly swelled immensely, turning from red to pink to white, but still with a few red spots here and there. And then my aircraft hit the concussion and maybe some of the debris too. I, I lost quite a lot of seconds and probably had a lot of luck because when I got sorted out I find that I was coming down fast. Something had carried away three quarters of my starboard wing and messed up the tip of the other, so I reckon it was time to try the ejector. And rather to my surprise, it worked. He paused reflectively, and then he added, I don't know that it gives you a lot besides confirmation, but there are one or two points. One is that they are capable of travelling a lot faster than those you saw. Another is that whatever they are, they are highly vulnerable. And that, as we talked it over in detail, was about all the additional information he did provide. That, and the fact that when hit, they did not disintegrate into sections, but exploded completely, which should perhaps have conveyed more than it seemed to at the time. During the next few weeks, several more letters trickled in without adding much. Then it began to look as if the whole affair were going the way of the Loch Ness Monster. What there was came to me because it was generally conceded at EBC that fireball stuff was my pigeon. Several observatories confessed themselves puzzled by detecting small red bodies travelling at high speeds but were extremely guarded in their statements. None of the newspapers ran it because, in editorial opinion, the whole thing was suspect in being too similar to the flying saucer business, and their readers would prefer more novelty in their sensations. Nevertheless, bits and pieces did slowly accumulate though it took nearly two years before they acquired serious publicity and attention. This time it was a flight of 13. A radar station in the north of Finland picked them up first, estimating their speed as 1,500 miles per hour, and their direction as approximately southwest. In passing the information on, they described them simply as unidentified aircraft. The Swedes picked them up as they crossed their territory and managed to spot them visually, describing them as small red dots. Norway confirmed, but estimated the speed at under 1,300 miles per hour. 
A Scottish station logged them as travelling at a thousand miles per hour and just visible to the naked eye. Two stations in Ireland reported them as passing directly overhead on a line slightly west of southwest. The more southerly station gave their speed as 800 and claimed that they were clearly visible. A weather ship at about 65 degrees north gave a description which tallied exactly with that of the earlier fireballs and calculated a speed close to 500 miles per hour. They were not sighted again after that. The reason that this particular flight got onto the front pages when others had been ignored was not simply that this time there had been a series of observations which plotted its track. It lay more in the implications of the line that had been drawn. However, in spite of innuendo and direct suggestion, there was silence to the east. Ever since their hurried and unconvincing explanation which followed the first atomic explosion in Russia, her leaders had found it convenient to feign at least temporary deafness to questions on such matters. It was a policy which had the advantages of calling for no mental exertion, while at the same time building up in the minds of the general public a feeling that inscrutability must mask hidden power. And since those who were well acquainted with Russian affairs were not going to publish the degree of their acquaintanceship, the game of aloofness was easily able to continue. The Swedes announced, with careful lack of particularising, that they would take action against any similar violation of their sky, whoever might be the violators. The British papers suggested that a certain great power was zealous enough in guarding its own frontiers to justify others in taking similar measures to protect theirs. American journals said that the way to deal with any Russian aircraft over US territory was to shoot first. The Kremlin, apparently, slept. There was a sudden spate of fireball observation. Reports came in from so far and wide that it was impossible to do more than sort out the more wildly imaginative and put the rest aside to be considered at more leisure, but I noticed that among them were several accounts of fireballs descending into the sea that tallied well with my own observation. So well, indeed, that I could not be absolutely sure that they did not derive from my own broadcast. All in all, it appeared to be such a muddle of guesswork, tall stories, third-hand impressions and thoroughgoing invention that it taught me little. One negative point, however, did strike me. Not a single observer claimed to have seen a fireball descend on land. Ancillary to that... Not a single one of those descending on water had been observed from the shore. All had been noticed from ships, or from aircraft well out to sea. For a couple of weeks, reports of sightings in groups large or small continued to pour in. The sceptics were weakening. Only the most obstinate still maintained that they were hallucinations. Nevertheless, we learnt nothing more about them than we'd known before. No pictures. So often it seemed to be a case of the things you see when you don't have a gun but then a flock of them came up against a fellow who did have a gun, literally. The fellow in this case happened to be the USN carrier Tuskegee. The message from Curaçao that a flight of eight fireballs was headed directly towards her reached her when she was lying off San Juan, Puerto Rico. The captain breathed a short hope that they would commit a violation of the territory and made his preparations. The fireballs, true to type, kept on in a dead straight line which would bring them across the island and almost over the ship herself. The captain watched their approach on his radar with great satisfaction. He waited until the technical violation was indisputable. Then he gave the word to release six guided missiles at three-second intervals and went on deck to watch against the darkling sky. Through his glasses he watched six of the red dots change as they burst one after another into big white puffs. Well, that's settled them, he observed complacently. Now it's going to be mighty interesting to see who squeals, he added as he watched the two remaining red dots dwindle away to the northward. But the days passed and nobody squealed, nor was there any decrease in the number of fireball reports. For most people, such a policy of masterly silence pointed only one way, and they began to regard their responsibility as good as proved. In the course of the following week, two more fireballs that had been incautious enough to pass within range of the experimental station at Woomera paid for that temerity, and three others were exploded by a ship off Kodiak after flying across Alaska. 
Washington, in a note of protest to Moscow regarding repeated territorial violations, ended by observing that in several cases where drastic action had been taken, it regretted the distress that must have been caused to the relatives of the crews aboard the craft, but that responsibility lay at the door not of those who dealt with the craft, but with those who sent them out apparently under orders which transgressed international agreements. The Kremlin, after a few days of gestation, produced a rejection of the protest. It proclaimed itself unimpressed by the tactic of attributing one's own crime to another and went on to state that its own weapons, recently developed by Russian scientists for the defence of peace, had now destroyed more than 20 of these craft over Soviet territory and would, without hesitation, give the same treatment to any others detected in their work of espionage. The Kraken Wakes was written by John Wyndham and read by Stephen Moore. And the programme was produced in Belfast by Susan Carson.